Welcome back to Watch the Bookerman and to the second episode of this TNA 2010 series. Last week was Paul Heyman's first show at the helm of the promotion, that three hour live special to kick off the new year. But now we're back to the humdrum, the week to week, and this is where we sort of have to prove that it wasn't a one off, it wasn't just a case of putting all our build and all our eggs into that one basket, and we can continue to put on every single week shows of that quality. This is recorded on the Friday, just the day after. TNA used to do that in reality to cut down on cost and travel, but I've done it just so that I've got then a nine-day stretch to make sure everything's in place, everything is right for that Genesis pay-per-view. On that show last week, of course, Abyss became the new TNA Global Champion. Hamada and Awesome Kong became the Knockouts Tag Team Champions, while the other four titles in the company were successfully retained by their title holders. We had Mr. Anderson and Jeff Hardy debut in the company. We've got a couple more debuts tonight, but people who were actually signed before I got here and who I just didn't get the chance to use last week. We are in the impact zone once again, of course, and we're going to try and keep that momentum going. If you're still with me by the end, I'm going to have a quick look through the roster as well as a look forward to Genesis just to make sure that we're all on the same page of who's in the company and where we're going to go for this next show after this. But episode two of TNA Impact, I think it's going to be another really, really good episode. And we certainly kick off the show with something that's going to hopefully get the crowd up. And I'd like to say that this is something that I came up with. But strangely enough, the second show of the Hogan and Bischoff era actually began with Motor City Machine Guns versus Generation Me. Which, considering the perception of the Hogan Bischoff era, I found quite humorous. But actually, we do the same match, but reverse the result. The Motor City Machine Guns are our tag team champions. And despite it being Nick and Matt Jackson's debut... I did felt that it was okay for them to lose, considering it is the best team in the company. Saban and Shelley there were two really good performances. The Jacksons not doing too bad to say that they're not very well known and this was their debut. Unfortunately, Shelley was off his game, but you wouldn't really notice it from a solid performance. And I think this is the perfect fast-paced back-and-forth match that we can put on. I think it was high spots rated in the booking, and they go out to have an all-out match. I just wanted to really set up the crowd and get everybody hyped for the rest of the show. I think this match and the main event bookending the episode will really put across what we're trying to do. I have stuck with Generation Me for the Young Bucks' tag team name, but I am calling them Nick and Matt Jackson because I know I'd just slip back into doing that, and I don't think it's necessary really to have changed the name to Max and Jeremy Buck, so they are Nick and Matt Jackson, but also as Generation Me. For now, that might change. But after the match, the Motor City Machine Guns celebrate in the ring. They've picked up a very, very good win in a solid opening match. And the commentators promote that on Sunday, they will defend the World Tag Team Championships in an open challenge against a mystery team. All we know is that this team are not currently signed to TNA. Coming out from the back, Bear Money stop at the top of the ramp and James Storm lays down that Feast of Fire briefcase. Bear Money applaud Shelley and Sabin, but the tag team champions are understandably wary of the team who can take that shot at any time of their choosing. So we're further teasing the Feast of Fire, but we are putting over that Storm and Rue did say that they would pre-warn the Motor City Machine Guns. So it's unlikely they're going to invoke that match at Genesis, but who knows? Of course, very much an easy way to turn a team heel or similarly to reinforce them as a babyface team. And we promote that Genesis tag team title match, which the team I'm bringing in, I think are going to be a really, really good addition. I was certainly a big, big fan of these two competitors around that time. And we then get the formal introduction, I suppose, from Mauro and Taz. They talk about the show kicking off with a breathtaking match before leading into a recap package from last week's live three-hour impact special. They show the debuts of Jeff Hardy, Mr. Anderson, and we also see footage from the various title matches on the night, particularly AJ Styles' clean victory over Bobby Lashley that prompted Lashley to declare that he is quitting TNA. The commentators promote that there is a statement coming from him up next, and tonight AJ Styles will face Daniels in the main event. Marrow and Taz also putting over the history between the two former best friends turned bitter enemies, and that is going to be a heated match just three nights before that Genesis pay-per-view. And as promoted, Bobby Lashley comes out and addresses his release request from last week, and he says that he's spoken to Paul Heyman this week, and his request has been turned down. Lashley doesn't really give anything more than that, but it is Crystal who goes off on a rant and complains about Lashley being held captive. He shouldn't be held here against his will, but she is cut off, thankfully, by Mr. Anderson. Making his first appearance in the Impact Zone, Anderson says that he has crossed the line and he, for one, would be happy to see the back of Lashley. In fact, 
he reckons he could use the back of Lashley to officially sign this. Anderson pulls out his TNA contract, and while Lashley doesn't see the funny side, Anderson comes down to sign his TNA deal in the middle of the ring. We're just trying to get Anderson over as a babyface here. He's coming out and shutting up the annoying Lashleys, and he's in a way standing up for TNA. Lashley wants out, while Mr. Anderson is proud to sign his contract in the middle of the ring. Further annoying Lashley, Anderson says that since they're now both under TNA contract, he'll see him at Genesis. So we set up another match for Genesis there, the want away Bobby Lashley versus the newcomer Mr. Anderson, continuing the Bobby Lashley departure storyline, although since booking that first show, I'm having second thoughts about letting him go. So again, this nine days between this episode being recorded and Genesis is a key part of the final decision. And from the general opinion of people that I've seen, and my feelings really, I'm thinking there's going to be a way that we can keep Lashley in the company, albeit on a different schedule, considering I do still want to take into account the fact that he was focusing largely on his MMA career at this time, but setting up yet another match for Genesis as we go into an interview to promote Daniels versus AJ Styles tonight. AJ says that he doesn't know what is going on with his former best friend, but after what happened at Final Resolution, both Daniels and Tomko deserve an ass-kicking. JB then turns attention to the main event of Genesis, but AJ says that he can only focus on Daniels for now. As for Kurt Angle, he wants to talk to Angle in the ring after the match. After that main event, we are going to get a segment between AJ Styles and Kurt Angle. Hypes the main event, and hopefully if AJ Styles versus Daniels isn't enough of a hook to keep people around, that confrontation between the two Genesis main eventers will be. AJ improvising well, and while he does lose heat to the storyline, that's actually a decent promo from AJ Styles. It wasn't his strong suit at this time. He did his talking in the ring, and hopefully he can do that in the main event and deliver a very, very good match. We all know how good the chemistry between these two guys is, and hopefully that will reflect in a good rating for the main event. Tara and Velvet Sky then face off in the second match, and Tara picks up a victory despite interference from Madison Rain and Lacey Von Erich, the other two members of the Beautiful People. And actually, it's because ODB comes down despite what she's done in recent weeks, despite her personal animosity towards Tara. She helps Tara against the beautiful people. Although it is a fair victory, Tara was in control of the match before any of the involvement. She's, of course, not particularly happy to have to have relied on ODB, and that's really why ODB did it. After the match, Tara angrily takes a microphone, annoyed at ODB, and ODB sort of suggesting that Tara wouldn't have won the match without her. Tara says that ODB has cheated her out twice now, and now all she wants is a fair shot at the TNA Knockouts Championship. She doesn't see why that's so much to ask, but ODB is tired of Tara getting these title shots. She is going to give her one more shot on the condition that if Tara doesn't leave that match with a title, she never gets a shot at the Knockouts Championship ever again. Tara agrees, but she can already see the loophole in this deal. ODB could just clock her with that flask and cause herself to get disqualified. Therefore, Tara agrees to the match, but it has to be no disqualifications. Tara and ODB both improvising well, gaining heat to the storyline in a very, very good segment. We've not had that much time to build people up, and they're already getting decent segment reigns. I think that in three or four months, the progression is going to be there to see, which will be really, really good. And we do set up there the Genesis Knockouts Championship match, Tara versus ODB, no DQ, which gives a little bit of a stipulation because it is the third match they've had. We didn't want to just go and do the same match. I thought about two out of three falls, but then ODB's beat Tara twice, so that doesn't really make sense. But it continues to push the sort of heelish side of ODB's character, as well as raising the stakes with the fact that if Tara doesn't leave Genesis as the champion, she will never get a title shot again. We then get a backstage segment with the new global champion, Abyss, and that's really what the segment's about putting over, the fact that he defeated Eric Young last week to become the champion, but he is confronted by the world elite, minus their leader, who try to intimidate the monster with their superior numbers. Abyss isn't a at all afraid of any of them and pushes past the group until he gets to Rob Terry, who steps in his way. The muscle of the world elite isn't backing down from Abyss, but Abyss certainly isn't backing down from him. Abyss just pushes straight through Rob Terry. They will face in a one-on-one -on -one match later tonight, but as Abyss heads away, it is very, very clear that he is not concerned about the numbers game of the World Elite. So we're further trying to put over that Abyss is a monster. We've, we've stripped down his character, I suppose, in a way. 
for now. I do think he's going to develop over the next weeks and months, but for now, we just want to put over that he is terrifying, he is a monster, and as we'll see later tonight, he is a dominant global champion, albeit that not a global championship match. A scheduled interview with Daniels, who is doing his promotion for the main event. He's cut off when Homicide walks in, and he wants to speak to Daniels. It's hushed tones, and they go off to one side, but the cameras still pick up what Homicide is saying, so not a very good attempt at being covert there. But he's asking Daniels about suicide, what he knows about him. Last year, there was, or maybe the year before, there was a storyline where Daniels was accused of being suicide, and then the reveal was that it wasn't. But Homicide thinks that Daniels knows something. Homicide knows the identity, and he needs to get into contact with the guy behind the suicide mask so they can work out some business. The storyline is or has been that Homicide wants to blackmail Suicide. He doesn't care about exposing him to the world for the sake of exposing him. He wants to get something out of it. But Daniels doesn't want to talk to Homicide now. He says they'll talk about it later in a way that's clear that he's trying to fob him off. JB looks to resume the interview, but Daniels' mind is elsewhere. He seems sort of put off and concerned about Homicide's interest in Suicide, the wrestler, and he walks off. Daniels and Tomko an awkward pairing there. That might hurt the main event a little bit. Hopefully not too much. And Homicide struggle when going off script. But it's still actually a decent segment. So not too bothered about any of that. As we go into a video package that's supposed to be on Abyss and Eric Young. But it is promoting Abyss v Rob Terry. It's short. It just shows. Well, it's as short as the match was last week. Abyss destroyed World Elite and hit a black hole slam it was to Eric Young to pick up the championship in under two minutes. We have a dominant champion, and we're further, further, further putting that over. Like I said, it's almost overkill on how dominant Abyss has been, and he puts in a really good performance. And that is a very good match for... I didn't think that an Abyss v Rob Terry match would be getting that rating, but not going to complain at all. A choke slam from Abyss to Rob Terry. The match having a lot of interference. Again, the British Invasion trying to get involved. Kiyoshi... Sheikh Abdul Bashir, but Abyss fought them all off and then beat Rob Terry in under six minutes. Like I said, he is a. I, I, I hope he's got the squash master thing. I don't know if he, I don't know if Abyss was ever like particularly no. I know he had a lot of squashes because he was a big man, but yeah, he's not got the note. I don't think it's a very good match. I think considering who was involved after the match, the thwarted members of the World Elite then band together get some sort of organisation going and begin a four-on-one beatdown of Abyss. They lay into the global champion when running down from the back, Beer Money rekindle their issues with the World Elite and particularly British Invasion, clearing the ring of Bashir, Kiyoshi, Magnus and Williams. Despite being saved from a severe beating, Abyss makes it clear that he doesn't want any help and he doesn't want any friends. Beer Money put their arms up, they don't want any trouble with Abyss, they were just trying to help him out, but they leave the ring, Abyss standing tall. And we're furthering the... Not so much that Abyss is a tweener, but he's that exact, he's not like a baby face. He's not going to be making friends with anybody. He's a lone figure. He is a volatile, dangerous monster. And he will face Eric Young in a rematch at Genesis. And things aren't looking good for Eric Young based on the last couple of weeks that we've seen. Ending the first hour, Mauro and Taz try and hook everybody in for the second hour. Discussing the events of the night so far. Things are only going to get better as we have a huge main event between AJ Styles and Daniels. They also promote the confirmed matches for Genesis this Sunday. AJ Styles versus Kurt Angle, ODB versus Tara, Motor City Machine Guns versus a mystery team, Abyss v Eric Young, as I just said, Bobby Lashley versus Mr. Anderson, potentially something that I've missed. At the end of the show, I will go through the full card. Everything will be confirmed by then so we can run through all the matches as we go into the second hour of the show and Kurt Angle is interviewed about AJ Styles inviting him to the ring later tonight and he confirms that he will be speaking to AJ after the main event. He can't wait to hear what the champion has to say just three days before their match at Genesis. While Kurt Angle did struggle when going off script, it is a good promo and he says that he has something that he wants to say to AJ Styles tonight and he thinks the world is going to want to hear it. So we're further promoting that main event or the post main event segment we're trying to really keep people hooked for the full duration of the show and Kurt Angle has something to say to AJ Styles and we then go into the fourth match of the night lethal consequences versus Hernandez and Morgan and during the match the commentators confirm that consequences Creed will be invoking his feast or fire to get an X division championship match against amazing red this Sunday we're putting over Creed's integrity there but it could be perceived as a lack of a killer instinct. He could have invoked that at any time of his choosing, and he's chose a time when Amazing Red is relatively fresh, and when there's no real benefit of him using it, he's just using it to take a title shot, when last week five people got a title shot just for being there. Matt Morgan and Hernandez pick up a win over Lethal Consequences. Jay Lethal the one taking the fall to protect Consequences Creed for that pay-per-view match, and while we continue the story 
Lethal and Creed had that meeting with Paul Heyman, and there's even talks that there's questions over their future, that they aren't showing the right level of commitment for Paul Heyman. That's the implication. Of course, I've got no intention of getting rid of either of these guys. It's just the start of the seeds for their storyline, and it gives us a chance to showcase Hernandez and Morgan, who I think are a fairly unique team. We've got a lot of teams who can go in the ring in terms of like we saw earlier, Generation Me, Most Machine Guns, and Lethal Consequences, whereas these offer something different, which I think is great. You've always got to have a melting pot in your roster, and both men putting in decent performances and stand tall after the match as we go into a vignette for D'Angelo De Niro. He's in his childhood home, and he talks about coming from a poor family and working his way up for everything he has today. It's a rags-to-riches story, the package also features his family and friends from childhood. They all have glowing words for the Pope, of course. He hasn't changed one bit despite all his success and all his fame. Pope says that he is thankful to God for everything that he has, and that gratitude is why he will never stop working hard, and he will not waste the gifts that he were given. So, at the minute, the in-ring style is all about putting over the people who can really, really go. Daniel Dino was a good wrestler, but I don't think in terms of being on the AJ Styles, Daniels, that type of guy level. I think his USP, his strength was his character work and his promos. He had such strong charisma, he could really cut a great promo. And that's why his first few weeks of the Paul Heyman era is just about getting character, character, character work. We're putting over who D'Angelo De Niro is so that people care about his ring work when he eventually debuts. And... We're still treading that line with him, I think. He's doing good things. He's being put over as a humble guy. But there's still that air of almost being too good. He's getting his family and friends to sing his praises. His squeaky clean image. And we sort of... It's going to be a grey area where we go with D'Angelo De Niro. The first proper storyline that I've got for him. You could see either side as being the face and either side of being the heel. And I quite like that. And I think it's going to be a good storyline. So this is just laying all the foundations for that as we go into another segment. Now Jeremy Brash wants to talk to Daniels now that hopefully he's back in the right mind state. So he goes in the locker room and asks him if he's heard the news about his match with Samoa Joe at Genesis. Daniels hadn't. He's angry for one to be first hearing this from Jeremy Borash, but he flips out when JB tells him that if he loses on Sunday, Tomko is gone from TNA. Daniels is furious and things are only compounded when JB tells him that Tomko is bad from ringside for that match on Sunday. Daniels can't believe what he's hearing. Things have gone from bad to worse and he still has to try and focus on AJ Styles in the main event. He blames Jeremy Borash for knocking him off his preparation, kicks him out of the locker room. It's not a very good segment from Daniels there. Although he was superb working without a script and had the crowd in the palm of his hand, it's not come out that well. So maybe that's to do with him not having very good chemistry with Tonko and it knocking the segment off. Maybe it's to do with not particularly being that over and we need to build him up a bit more. I don't know. I'll have to have a look at that after the show and work out what's going wrong with Daniels because I do think he was quite a good promo at that time and the fifth match of the night is a short squash match Tracy Brooks and Roxy thrown together to be the sacrificial lambs for Awesome Kong and Hamada Awesome Kong head and shoulders above Hamada not doing particularly well the same in ring performance as Tracy Brooks again somebody who we probably need to get a bit more momentum and a bit more over and we will see the results I hope Mara and Al and Alicia Flash have great chemistry at the announcers table I probably would have forgot to mention that but Alyssa Flash joins commentary she's had a bit of a medium term rivalry with Tracy Brooks and that is going to come to a head on a future episode as our way of introducing Alyssa Flash who we want to position as somebody who we're going to push in the knockouts division but it's a fairly straightforward win less than three minutes Kong pinning Roxy I'd rather that have been Tracy really but forgot to do it and we promote that Genesis Sarita and Taylor Wilde will take their tag team titles rematch and as Kong and Hamada stand tall in the ring we do also see footage of Kong and Hamada winning the titles becoming only the second knockouts tag team champions in the history of that championship as we lead into a sit down interview Mike Tenay was somebody who it wasn't so popular me taking him off the commentary team but he's still going to be part of impact shows going forward so hopefully that offsets the disappointment of Mauro replacing him that some people had. Team 3D and Rhino are interviewed by him in a sit-down style segment and he's trying to get to the bottom of their issues with Paul Heyman. They explain why they fired up two months since the announcement that Heyman was coming and the three guys he has most history with in TNA, he didn't give him a single call. They ask what Paul Heyman has planned for them and Rhino suggests that he's going to try to do to them what he's done to Mike. Brother Ray then says that today might be happy being replaced and taking it like a little bitch, but they certainly won't be. This is a warning to Paul Heyman. He better be careful how he treats the Extreme Alumni. I don't think they're going to call themselves the Extreme Alumni because I don't think that's a very good name, but 
he's got to be careful how he treats Brother Ray, Brother Devon and Rhino. Brother Ray, surprisingly, the one not doing well that script. Typically the better of the three in terms of promos, but everybody else doing well. The extreme unrest storyline starting with this. And this is just a case of reflecting the real life storyline that I'm doing. I'm not sure where these guys fit in with the company. Brother Ray and Brother Devon both lost weight, reinvented themselves and did really good things over the course of the next couple of years. I don't know where they fit in at the minute. They're not young, hungry and aggressive. Well, they're aggressive, but they're not the first two things. And yeah, I don't know where they fit in, but we are doing a little bit of a storyline, at least in the first couple of months with them, that plays into the fact that Paul Heyman, who supposedly has history with these guys, also looks to have no interest in keeping them in TNA. Desmond Wolf then comes out to the ring. This is on the 90 minute max. We've got half an hour left of the show and he calls out Jeff Hardy, unhappy with the sneak attack on last week's impact. He calls Hardy a coward who won't face him when he calls him out man to man right now. He needs to attack him from behind. That is typical Jeff Hardy, but this draws out Paul Heyman. There's no Jeff Hardy to answer the call out. And while Heyman doesn't want to get into it with Wolf, he's not here to make enemies. He says that Desmond knows exactly why Jeff isn't here. To make it easy, he's going to show him the footage. CCTV from the Impact Zone then shows Desmond Wolf jumping at Jeff Hardy from behind. And he actually drove a ladder into the back of Jeff Hardy's skull. Hardy had to be taken away from the building. And that's why he's not here tonight. But Heyman says, while Jeff isn't here right now, he will be there at Genesis. And he suggests that Wolf brings himself to that pay-per-view as Jeff Hardy makes his TNA debut against Desmond Wolf. We're trying to give back Wolf the heat by showing that attack on screen after what happened last week. And he's lost a couple of matches recently, but it also sets up a match for the pay-per-view just before the main event. As we get a backstage segment, the commentators are trying to lead into the main event when we come back from that segment. But they hear of another backstage incident, the cameras catching Samoa Joe laying into Tom Quinn in the back. Daniels is trying to get him off him, but Joe is just relentless. He will not let Tom Cole go. Daniels essentially has no choice, led away by backstage workers. The main event's up next. Whether Tom Cole's there or not, Daniels has got to go and compete. And we lead into that main event. Fantastic heat and great wrestling. A 70 rating is pretty good. I know these two are capable of very, very good matches. And 83 from AJ Styles is exactly what we want to see. If he can raise the bar a little bit for Genesis and if Kurt Angle can come and bring the performance levels that we know he can do, then we're in for a really, really good main event, I think. Daniels has an in-ring performance of 74, which is okay. Great chemistry between the two. Maro letting us down, which again, I think will be the theme of the big matches in this series. Kurt Angle and AJ, I think, will put on a match that he will struggle to reach the levels of. And Daniels and Tomko are an awkward pairing. Tomko isn't supposed to be there, but I didn't take him off as the manager. But that does give me something to think about. I was going to say, does the Daniels and Tomko alliance continue considering that they work so badly together? And it's probably holding Daniels back a little bit. We got the crowd buzzing with the main event, however, and AJ Styles defeats Daniels in 15 minutes 50 by pinfall with the Styles clash. As promoted throughout the night, Kurt Angle comes down to speak to AJ Styles, but the commentators first put over the fact that if Daniels is pinned this Sunday like he was by AJ then, Tomko will be gone from the company, but AJ Styles is ready, and the champion and challenger show mutual respect for one another, but before AJ can say anything, Kurt says that he has something that he wants to say first. He's got something to get off his chest. And while he puts over the champion and the, every single bit of praise he gets, Kurt thinks that AJ deserves. But for those who don't know, Kurt says that AJ was handed the TNA World Heavyweight title. This isn't a conspiracy. This isn't Kurt making outlandish claims. He was there. AJ Styles doesn't really know what Kurt's getting at. But Kurt says that Sting knew that his time was up. He was on his way out. And he let AJ win at no surrender. AJ can't deny that. He'd said it himself before in the build-up to Bound for Glory. But Kurt says that he's not saying that to try and discredit AJ Styles or his run as the champion. He was always going to be a world champion and he is that good that he deserves to be the champion. But it doesn't change the fact that he was handed his first ever TNA World Heavyweight Championship. At Genesis, Kurt Angle is going to make him earn it. The two then go face to face to end the show. It's clearly pretty heated between the two. AJ Styles not really got anything to say in response, but that is just based on the fact that I watched No Surrender and I've watched all the pay-per-views in the build-up to this few months and it, that's what happened. The booking was that Sting kind of let AJ Styles win the match. So Kurt Angle, who lost the title because of that, would have that bone to pick and it does add a little bit of needle between the two. Kurt Angle essentially saying that you're only champion because of what somebody else did and this Sunday you're going to have to beat the best guy, the best wrestler in the world to prove it and if Kurt Angle wins the title, obviously he's 
establishing himself as the best wrestler in the world adds a little bit of history and it shows that Angle is sort of feeling this backs against the wall. He does feel like he's being pushed out and he is hitting out and lashing out AJ Styles. If AJ can beat Kurt Angle, Kurt said it himself, he will have earned his place as the champion and it will solidify him as the top guy in the company. So either way the match goes on Sunday, I do think there's a little bit of an interesting dynamic that's been established by that end segment. It's a 62, increased our popularity in 31 regions. It's not amazing by any stretch, but it's, like I said, we're laying good foundations for where we want to go in the future. The shows are going to get better, but we're still increasing our popularity in 31 regions, and yeah, no complaints about that show whatsoever. As we go, the go-home show there for Genesis, so we will go into that pay-per-view. I'm going to have some emails, maybe even some decisions to make here. I'm not going to check them just yet, because we have to have a little look at the roster. Everybody's been brought in, and I think I'm going to start by looking at the creative. So, two of the guys there not really been used yet, and maybe not being used. There's another thing that I've been thinking about, Mick Foley perhaps using him in a angle or two, maybe giving him one last storyline before we fully put him out to pasture. Not 100% sure decided on that, but obviously his mic skills mean, and I think he's probably going to be top or second of the talk the talk it does mean that he has some value so it'd be a shame again to just let him go similarly with sting that again that's prompted a bit of a response that people don't think i should get rid of sting he's 50 years old he doesn't fit with the vision of course but you can't deny obviously the star presence and the charisma he has and everything he is a star and seeing him go to wwe would potentially be damaging to the company but then i kind of like the idea of seeing Sting go to the company and what he could have done had he gone at a time when he was closer to his prime, not in his prime at 50 but closer. Kurt Angle Top is great to see though, he has everything you want to arguably be the figurehead of the company and the fact that he is that over 40 guy I think is going to make for some interesting storylines going forward. Good to see a new sign in there with Jeff Hardy, didn't see him on this show but again he's somebody who's going to be a huge part of the show going forward and making up the top 5, thankfully he's AJ Styles, our TNA World Heavyweight Champion, it would have been a little bit concerning if he wasn't in that select group. The next big things we have Alex Shelley, Jay Lethal, Nick Jackson, Chris Sabin. Would have been nice to see Matt Jackson as the fifth place there, but certainly four of the guys who I see a lot of potential in, particularly, of course, the Motor City Machine Guns. But Jay Lethal, we've got a storyline to move him away from the Macho Man parody gimmick at the minute. Five of the hot prospects, Brutus Magnus, Consequences Creed and Shake Abdul Bashir, not on that original list. Bashir, perhaps quite surprisingly, he left TNA in reality when Hogan and Bischoff came in, but he did have a good relationship with Paul Heyman, so and he's all, it's so surprising when you see that Davari's only 25. Again, maybe somebody, and he's certainly got a role to play for the time being. How that'll develop going forward, we will see, but definitely a place on the roster for somebody like him. Like I said, yeah, Mick Foley the best on the mic, Kurt Angle second best, Paul Heyman third, surprisingly, I'd, I'd put him first, but... Maybe I'm a little bit biased. Mr. Anderson, again, good to see a new signing making up that group. And Sting, again, showing... Sting and Mick Foley, really, both showing why it might be a little bit premature to get rid of them. Showstoppers, again, Sting in there. But four of the guys who we see a lot in, of course. Samoa Joe will be featured heavily going forward. Jeff Hardy, AJ Styles, Kurt Angle, of course. These are the people who... We want to be putting on the best matches. These are all going to feature in pay-per-view main events over the next year. So that is who we want in that category. The ring generals, we have the three guys from that Unbreakable 2005 best match in TNA history, which is unsurprising to see. Kurt Angle, top of that list. I think what this is showing as much as anything is that Kurt Angle is just the best wrestler in the world. Maybe not in the world, but certainly in the company. So we're certainly going to present him as the best wrestler in the world. I'm so happy to have this Kurt Angle on the roster. Like, I've booked a few modern day games recently and Kurt Angle on the time decline is not quite as fun as this Kurt Angle who just had the intent, just a brilliant, brilliant character to be able to book. Bobby Lashley, AJ, Samoa Joe Abyss and Amazing Red. So three of our champions making up the top five of the Who's Hot, which is obviously good to see. Bobby Lashley, who has got a question mark over his future and Samoa Joe, who holds the world title feast off fired briefcase. So I'd say that's all fair, fairly reasonable other than Tara which is a little bit disappointing but hopefully we can build her back up and the game is suggesting not really interested in any of them well Reptitus is on the short list I think but other, the other four probably won't be coming into the company and we'll just have a quick look now at the rest of the roster who are our stars major stars currently I think we'll have a few major stars Kurt Angle and the like so we've got quite a few actually major stars AJ Styles, Bobby Lashley, Brother Ray, Jeff Hardy, Jeff Jarrett, Kurt Angle, Mick Foley, 
Mr. Anderson, Paul Heyman, Samoa Joe, Sting and Taz. So quite a lot of them either aren't in-ring performers or are the people who we're not going to be using. So maybe a little bit concerning. Surprised to see Brother Raid, but he was very well known and I'd probably like to see him maybe one step down. Our stars, I'm assuming, Brother Devon's going to be in this. Yeah, in the sort of upper mid card this is. And I'd say that's a fairly decent representation of the upper mid card of TNA. Over time, we're going to hopefully have Brother Ray and Brother Devon maybe down a little bit. And the likes of these guys, for instance, Alex Shelley and Chris Sabin, who are only well known at the minute, but are the people who we're going to try. And in fact, this is D'Angelo De Niro, Desmond Wolf, James Storm, Robert Roode. This is almost a who's who of the people who want to push up to that next level. So it's good that they've got a decent foundation, a good basis to grow into more prominent positions. And going through this just reiterates what a great roster we've got. These are maybe, I don't know if this is another lower mid cat. Shouldn't really try and equate it to the old push system. I need to get used to this perception system. And I really do think it's a improvement in a way. Obviously, categorizing your roster was easier back then. But this is definitely a good way to see the progression of your roster. And that is a very long list. We've got people, I think, I assume, in every single one of these groups. We'll go to unimportant. So that's the only remaining category. And there's quite a lot in that concerningly, but like again, a lot of them are out of ring pushes. Hamada's somebody who, 32 in the southeast, but we do want to see her built up there. But that's the overall roster, and I think going through that just gives me all the confidence in the world that this is going to be a successful save. We've got such, such a great roster. Genesis in 15 days' time is incorrect, so I'm going to have to change that. That should be on the Sunday after the second show. So I'm just gonna change that to Sunday week two. But that is the next event, TNA Genesis, coming very, very soon. And I think we've got a great stacked card for that. AJ Styles versus Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe Daniels, Motor City Machine Guns versus a mystery team, which I think is gonna be a really, really good addition to the tag team division. ODB v Tara, that's just a few of the matches. It's gonna be, I think, a great, great pay-per-view and hopefully we can deliver on that. TNA Genesis, a key landmark night in the company, our first pay-per-view of the Paul Heyman era, and I think AJ Styles v Kurt Angle is going to produce an excellent pay-per-view main event, cannot wait to get that show booked.